forward. The story of architecture begins in Mesopotamia around 7000 BC and reaches into the global architecture of the 21st century. Jonathan Glancy brings two special qualities to bear on his encyclopedic task. First, he has visited most of the buildings about which he writes. The reader might be tempted to take this for granted but, regretfully, there are some who write at length about buildings which they have only seen in photographs and the difference tells. The second factor is his infectious enthusiasm for the subject. Architecture touches all of our senses and as we sit. Remote from actuality, turning the pages of a book, Jonathan brings the buildings, and the stories behind them, alive for us. This book reminds us that our culture is about the making of things, a process which starts with the provision of shelter from the elements. Architecture transcends this basic need and its expression across time and space is as varied as the parallel worlds of plant and animal species. Jonathan is a wonderful communicator and here he explores the underlying principles behind architecture of wide-ranging diversity. His insights are always lively and stimulating. I particularly like the historical vignettes which trace the culture of the time and place, through musicians, artists, architects, engineers, and clients, all of whom come together to shape the buildings and places. This could well prove to be the guidebook to inspire your next architectural pilgrimage. Jonathan Glancy aims to bring the story of architecture, and all who play a role in its creation, to the widest possible audience. He succeeds admirably. Preface The history of architecture is one of remarkable human endeavor, one of the means through which we try to create order and make sense of our endlessly intriguing, yet messy world. And to provide ourselves with shelter, we all live and work in buildings. From the humblest to the sublime, there is no reason why any of these should be less than inspiring even in small ways. The turn of a stair. The way sunlight falls through windows in mesmerizing patterns on floors. Materials cool to the touch in the heat of summer. The rhythm of an arcade. The pregnant quality of a dome. At its best, architecture, which is different from mere building, lifts our spirits and sends shivers down our spines, at its worst, it belittles us, although it really shouldn't. Ever. This book is a concentrated summary of buildings, places, and ideas about architecture that from adulthood have drawn me to them like the proverbial moth to a flame. I have visited just about every building in the book, which is more or less how they were chosen. Writing about buildings on visit D seems wrong, but there are some no history of architecture could possibly leave out. There are many others I could have shown, but I have had to be selective otherwise this book will ULD be as big as a small building. Architecture is a huge subject encompassing the history of civilization, so although I've tried my level best, it cannot be truly comprehensive. But I hope the history of architecture will make you want to see and experience these buildings and others worldwide and to discover more about the manned ways we have chosen to frame our lives. Introduction Except on rare escapes To desert landscapes or trekking high in mountains, or sailing the high seas, most human beings are surrounded by buildings. There is, though, a difference, a very important one underscore between building and architecture. Animals can build. Termites build spectacular high-rise nests in the Australian bush. Birds build nests, too. Some, like that of the bower bird of Australia and New Guinea, of real sophistication and beauty. Bees build spectacular hives, their innate sense of geometry and knowledge of lightweight materials unsurpassed. Humans, though, developed architecture. This is, to be blunt, the science and art of building, or to be more poetic, the moment that a building is imbued with a knowing magic that transforms it from mere shelter into that of a self-conscious work of art. This art might offend and baffle as well as delight. Yet from the magnificence of the Parthenon and the graciousness of the temples of Mahabalapuram, through the soaring ambition of medieval Gothic cathedrals to the skyscrapers of the 20th century, architecture is a continually evolving art. It maps our ambitions in three solid dimensions. It is the greatest visible means by which we celebrate our wealth and health, think of all the great churches and temples raised to thank God gods and saints that some virulent plague had passed by, and a form of staircase to heaven. From ancient times about eight or nine thousand years ago humankind began reaching for the sky with extraordinary structures that resembled either holy mountains, pyramids, or early lightning conductors, towers, steeples, up which their priests could ascend to meet the sky gods or down which, presumably, the gods could step to earth. The first real works of architecture we know of are temples. This makes sense. Ever since the Bronze Age when the male, or sky, 
gods triumphed over the prehistoric earth goddess s in most parts of the world mankind has attempted to connect with the eternal and to build in harmony with the cosmos the fact that ancient temples are designed to line up with equinoxes and eclipses and other movements and patterns seen in the stars should come as no surprise mankind wanted to tune in with the mind that created the universe it is significant that in monotheist religions notably christianity underscore god has been referred to as the great and original architect no wonder so many architects have had such big egos what was equally important was that an understanding or connection to the gods made the land or sea men fished long before they developed agriculture fruitful stonehenge for example an observatory and temple of sorts was probably the mainspring of a giant theodolite or clock that connected to a network of megalithic stone circles set around britain enabled our ancient forebears to read the stars and thus navigate their ancient trade routes successfully today we wear such nationwide technology on our wrists in the form of watches and chronometers i mention this not simply because of my fascination with the rise of civilization but because it reminds me of just how important architecture has been to our lives and how distinct it is from building architecture has always been something of a religion and architects a kind of priesthood at their best as you can see and even read about in this book they have been like shamans or magicians tricking stone brick and marble iron steel titanium and polycarbonates into sensation structures that raise our spirits above everyday concerns over the centuries new technologies have allowed architects to practice their art with ever greater dexterity but also to make more mistakes than were possible at the time of the building of the pyramids or stonehenge and just as great world religions tend to get watered down and split into sects and warring factions with the passing of generations so has architecture at the beginning of the 21st century there are many more people and exponentially more architects than there certainly hasn't led to an increase in the quality of architecture why because we no longer build to connect humankind to god or to make sense of our place in the cosmos but for any number of mundane banal fashionable and profitable reasons that reduce architecture to a vainglorious and earthly pursuit it is significant that at the very time in history when technology allows buildings to be more thrilling than they ever have been so many are so lackluster so many more demeaning indeed at the beginning of the 21st century the architect's role has declined to survive to continue to excite us as great mosques and temples have done over the millennia architects need to rediscover the high ground of the imagination to be the shamans and magicians their predecessors were before the industrial revolution when mere building became all too easy there are of course architects working today who are as great as an who have existed in the past like any great artist many feel they are few and far between as for the rest of us it is up to us to encourage cajole prompt demand criticize to ensure that our demanding greedy and unbalanced global civilization is housed and set against backdrops that promise to raise us to the realm of the gods but of course we get the architecture we deserve if we truly want to live banal lives then the artless world of the air conditioned shopping mall the cartoon world of theme park and leisure center the furtive world of the gated suburban housing development with its triple garaged houses designed in coy traditional styles together with those of the faceless distribution depot the sad call center and the soulless office park beckons this is a very long way from the gods and from architecture as most of us would like it to be a story that was first told some 8 or 9000 years ago in the beginning At the beginning of the 21st century it is hard to imagine a time when the only architect was God or the gods and the many species of humankind that once shared the world had no need for architecture or at least not in their conscious imagination. In fact, there were species of insects and birds that built more sophisticated homes than our hunter-gatherer forebears. Despite what theorists in 18th century Europe wanted to believe, the origins of architecture had no mystical beginning and there was no one way of building shelters as homes or places of worship. Architecture emerged from the first self-conscious shaping of homes, monuments, and cities some 8 or 9000 years ago, or as the German architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe put it, when two bricks were put together well. The growth of cities, the rise of civilization. Architecture began when humankind took up farming on a regular basis. Now there, ed for people to live in settled places and to tend the land rather than to hunt and gather, nomadically as their ancestors had done and as humans still do in certain parts of the world at the beginning of the 21st century this new way of life emerged in two places at more or less the same time along the banks of the nile river and across the fertile crescent the once lushly green and well watered land following a
curve from the Tigris slash Euphrates Delta, west along the course of these rivers toward Syria, and then down along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. It was known to the writers of the Bible as the setting of the Garden of Eden, for that is how it must have appeared. The earliest architecture and the first cities were thus in what today we know as Egypt, Israel, Iraq, and Iran. The birth of architecture settled down to farm the peoples of these ancient lands created the first cities, and in those cities they raised permanent homes, shrines, and then temples and palaces. The birth of architecture was thus contemporaneous with the birth of the city and the feeding of the city by the farmlands that served it, as it in turn served them. Civilization, as we understand it, had begun its long, sometimes magnificent, and often terrifying ascent. The very word civilization stems from the Latin word civis, meaning a citizen or a city dwe. Schler, the earliest known urban development, and thus the starting point for architecture, was Jericho. Excavations have uncovered houses, built of mud bricks, and doubtless attractive in their day dating. Back beyond 8000 BC, and shrines from about 7000 BC. Ancient cities such as Jericho would have appeared quite familiar to our eyes, aside from cars, electricity, ads for Coca-Cola, and satellite television dishes. Many small and remote Middle Eastern and North African towns and villages have barely changed in their appearance over the ensuing 10,000 years. What drove architecture upward and toward a technological and artistic greatness beyond that of the home was a fruitful marriage of wealth and ambition. The first citizens were soon led by priests and monarchs. Priests appeased and interpreted the will of a pantheon of gods who had the power to make the land bountiful or barren, in turn, citizens looked after the priests who became, in most societies, increasingly wealthy, pampered, and frightening. To protect themselves from the will of other humans living in rival cities and eventually kingdoms, nations, and countries, the citizenry turned to kings who raised armies, fought on their behalf, and protected the land that gave rise to the city. In return, kings were rewarded with or rewarded themselves with great wealth. The priests built temples, kings built palaces, and both built tombs, the architecture we travel thousands of miles to see on vacation, ziggurats and pyramids, temples of brick, temples of marble, reached for the sky and stole our imagination. The ziggurats, one of the greatest and most moving of the early temples is the ziggurat, stepped pyramid, of Ernamu at Yor in Samaria. A temple dedicated to Nana, the moon god, the ziggurat rose above a densely packed city of some 350,000 people like an artificial mountain, its peak reached by a daunting ceremonial stair. The temple was last remodeled by Ernamu and his successors in circa 2125 BC, although this mud brick behemoth is much older. It seems likely that successive generations built up from earlier bases and thus, accidentally at first, created the distinctive, haunting form of the ziggurat. It has been suggested that each level of the ziggurat would have been planted with trees so that it would have resembled, even more than it does today, a mountain adorned by nature yet bleached by a harsh sun. Perhaps, perhaps not. What we do know is that the great temple would have been visible for miles across the plain, a sign to farmers in outlying irrigated pastures that their priests were intervening with the gods on their behalf. One of the most famous ziggurats of the ancient world is known to us as the Tower of Babel. This was, in all likelihood, the temple of Etemenanki in Babylon, greatest of all the ancient Mesopotamian cities. The city reached its peak during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II, 605-563 BC. The Tower of Babel would have been a spiral structure, faced in blue glazed bricks and rising seven stories up from a square base with 295 lc.1-90 sides. It would have towered over Nebuchadnezzar's magnificent waterside palace on the banks of the Euphrates, famous for the legendary hanging gardens that hung in great, perfumed terraces built on top of a vaulted building. This would have stored water for the plants, as well as ice for the beakers o sherbet drunk by courtiers and the favored princes for whom the gardens, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, were hung. Babylon Although preceded by other great cities in the Fertile Crescent, notably Yor, Khorsabad, Nimrud, and Nineveh, Babylon was perhaps the first of the world's capital cities to be rigorously planned. The city was walled around, set on the east and west banks of the Euphrates, and crossed by a bridge, part of a great processional avenue that drove through the main temple and palace complex. We know it must have been an impressive as well as a colorful sight since the city's northern entrance, the Ishtar Gate, has been conserved. 
crenellated with tiny ziggurats along the tops of its walls. The gate is faced in characteristic blue glazed bricks interrupted by yellow and white bricks depicting lions and fabulous beasts. Perhaps only the gates of the Assyrian city, Khorsabad, of a century earlier were more impressive. Those that led into the palace of Sargon II, 722-705 BC, at Khorsabad were guarded by ineffable man-headed winged bulls, as frightening then as they are today. They are a reminder that these early civilizations could be pretty savage places to be on the wrong day, although this is true of many cities of the 21st century too, walls might be decorated extensively with skins flayed from enemies and rebels caught alive, and avenues lined with those in the torments of crucifixion. These early cities were sophisticated in some ways, yet barbaric in many others. Early Structures At this point in the development of Architecture Building techniques were Universally simple, sun-dried bricks, underscore th In general, laid on sun-dried bricks, with Little use of sparsely available timber and Stone and thus nothing in the way of Structural invention that would appear In Greece and Rome not long after Babylon's glory days The most distinctive Building type of these Mesopotamia civilizations was the ziggurat, and although impressive in terms of scale bulk and mystery, this was a very simple building type indeed compared with say a European Gothic cathedral. In fact it is fair to say that even the greatest building of the time, palace or temple, was little more sophisticated structurally than the simplest the house. In this sense, the ancient Mesopotamian cities would have seemed pretty much alike, the one of a kind, show-off building fighting to celebrate its own identity was still a long way off. The Persian Empire All of these cities and civilizations were eventually swallowed whole by the world's first great empire, that of the Persians founded by Cyrus II, circa 600 to 530 BC. What we see now is the beginning of the idea of fusion in architecture, or stylistic borrowing. Craft workers from across The Empire Assyrians, Babylonians, Egyptians and Ionian Greeks joined forces under imperial direction to create a new type of architecture. Freer in form, more decorative, and just a little more lighthearted than the somber ziggurats of ancient Mesopotamia. The greatest monument of this era was the Palace of Persepolis begun in S18 BC by Darius I and completed about 60 years later by Artaxerxes I. Even by this date we do not know the names of individual architects, only the kings and emperors whose glory they celebrated in brick, stone, and terracotta. The palace, raised on a mighty platform, was reached by a great rise of shallow stairs, so that horses could ride up it majestically dash flanked on either side by rich relief carvings depicting, among other subjects, images of the peoples and the warriors of the new empire. The palace comprised several buildings, including a harem and, most famously, the Hall of the Hundred Columns, a throne room 225 feet, 68.6 meters, square, it's painted, timber ceiling supported by a forest of columns topped with capitals in the guise of bulls and unicorns lavishly decorated and brightly colored the palace complex at Persepolis shows just how far architecture had moved from the elementary ziggurats and defensive walled cities that introduced humankind to the movingly simple such as the handsome tombs of the Achaemenid kings 5th century BC carved into a rock face at Nakshai Rustam, a reminder that the greatest architecture, throughout history, has often been the most pared down and thoughtful notion and reality of architecture. Even so, some of the very finest monuments of the wealthy and far-flung Persian Empire were movingly simple, such as the handsome tombs of the Achaemenid kings, 5th century BC, carved into a rock face at Nakshai Rustam, a reminder that the greatest architecture, throughout history, has often been the most pared down and thoughtful. <laughs>
Ancient Egypt Pyramids and Temples The architecture of ancient Egypt is truly a thing apart. Mysterious, consistent, and a law unto itself, it developed slowly over a very long period, some 3,000 years, for most of which time Egypt was free of invaders, wealthy, and well-organized. The country's fortune and culture were based on the cycle and flow of the Nile River. Each year the waters of the river rose and brought the valley into bloom. During this time of year, the country went into a kind of agricultural overdrive, producing food that would have to last through the succeeding drought, the dry season, and until the next year. Because there was little or nothing farmers and laborers could do on the land during the dry season, when the river fell, ancient Egypt had a surplus of skilled and unskilled labor for five months of every year. This labor was set to work on the monuments we associate with this enduring and ceaselessly fascinating culture, the pyramids. The pyramids were designed to house the mummified body of pharaohs and their treasures. In the Egyptian mind, the soul was immortal and the pharaoh a god. In due course the souls of the royal dead would return to their bodies and make use of the treasures stored for them in their vast stone monuments. The pyramid represented the apex of a religious culture obsessed for 3,000 years with death and the afterlife. The first Egyptian cities were necropolises, cities of the dead, and pyramids stood in the center of walled cities composed of temples and halls linked by long corridors lined with columns, the capitals of which were designed to resemble palm, lotus, and papyrus flowers. What a strange sight these necropolises would have been. Ordinary people lived along the riverbank in ephemeral and sprawling villages of simple, whitewashed mud brick houses. Models of these were placed in the royal tombs, which is one of the reasons we know so much about everyday life in ancient Egypt. Lane contrast, the dead set out on the long road to eternal life in some of the biggest and most impressive monuments ever built, set in well-ordered cities. The first, Pyramids The pyramids grew out of the earliest royal tombs, known as mastabas. These tended to be step structures, but rarely more than 25 feet, 7.6 meters, high. One of the earliest pyramids was the Step Pyramid of Zoser at Saqqara, beginning of the 3rd dynasty, circa 2778 BC, designed by King Zoser's architect, Lmhotep, who was deified in the 26th dynasty. Not only is Imhotep the first architect we know by name, but the pyramid he built was the world's first major monument built in stone. Given that the Egyptians never invented the pulley, this pyramid, like later ones, was an extraordinary feat of construction. Huge granite blocks from Aswan, weighing on average 2.5 tons, 2.54 tons, were brought up the Nile and then dragged on wooden rollers to the building site. They were heaved up mud ramps formed against the slope of the rising pyramid and I were into position, the accuracy with which Egyptian architects and masons worked has always been something of a mystery, but when you are building not for the next so or too years, but for eternity there is no point in doing things by half measure. The pyramid at Saqqara represents several rebuildings of an earlier mastaba, in its final form, as seen today, it became a six-step structure 197 feet, 60 meters, high, its base measuring 410 feet x 358 feet, 125 by 109 meters. The first of the smooth-sided pyramids was built at Majern for Huni, last king of the Third Dynasty. This began life as a stepped granite pyramid, 
but the sides were later encased in slabs of finely dressed tufa limestone, so that when the work was complete the monument appeared to be constructed of four massive equilateral triangles. The top stones may well have been gilded and the whole device, oriented precisely according to the points of the compass, would have shown in both sunlight and moonlight. The Great Pyramids of Giza The fourth dynasty was the Great Age of Pyramid Building. The most famous are the three sited together at Giza to the south of present-day Cairo. These are the pyramids of Cheops, Hephren, and Mykerinos. That of Cheops is one of the wonders of the world, ancient or modern. No less than 480 feet, 146.4 meters, high and rising from a base 756 feet, 230.6 meters, square, it remains one of the largest buildings of all time. The masons who built the Great Pyramid were also responsible for the gigantic and strange sculpture we know as the Sphinx, which slouches, half man, the head of the pharaoh Hephren, half beast in the precise shadow of its parent. It is interesting to note an inscription that tells us that the Sphinx was first restored under Thotmes IV in the 18th dynasty, circa 1425 BC. The conservation of old buildings and monuments is nothing new. And yet for all their enigmatic beauty and geometric brilliance, the pyramids, which reached their peak circa 2600 BC, the same time as the great Neolithic stone circle was erected at Avebury in southern England, were considered obsolete by about 2000 BC. The new kingdom of this time ushered in the rock tombs we associate foremost with the Valley of the Kings at Thebes, on the west bank of the Nile and not far from today's. Luxor These magnificent underground structures digging as deep as 315 feet, 96 meters, and as far as 689 feet, 210 meters, into the rocky Theban hills were designed unsuccessfully as it turned out, to baffle tomb robbers. Early Africa Traditional Architecture South of the Sahara, African architecture was once, in Western terms, something of a non-starter. There was a temptation to think that until the of European settlers and colonialists their arrival is nothing here more substantial than in Riyadh, of huts, and that even if some of these those of the Zulu and Indabele tribes in South Africa, for example were very beautiful, they could not be classified as architecture. What is certain is that without permanent building materials to hand next to nothing of ancient. African architecture has survived, although well planned. Houses have been excavated from the medieval era at El Gaba in what was the ancient Kingdom of Ghana and in the Swahili town of Gedi in Kenya. If we look at the African continent, in terms of modern, environmentally sensitive, architecture and consider the materials and practices used to construct its buildings. Africa has much to teach the West. Despite their scarcity, there are monumental ruins to be found in Africa, notably the grey at iron age enclosure at Great Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe. Circa 1000 to 1500 BC, a fortress-like compound underscore and the palace of Hujuni Kubwa, Tanzania. Circa 1245 Measuring 481 feet, 150 meters, by 241 feet, 75 meters, this seaside palace contained at least 100 rooms. These were windowless. Built of coral ragstone with dressed stonework. Around the doors, the royal chambers were barrel vaulted and ornamented with decorative stonework. The palace had an octagonal bathing pool and was laid out on a geometric grid. Elsewhere in Africa, there were fairly large cities, palaces, and forts, but as these tended to be built of mud, few have survived. One of the last, Benin City, once the center of a thriving empire, was destroyed by the fire shortly after the British. Colonialists arrived in 1897. Yet where it has survived or been successfully rebuilt, generation after generation, mud architecture is one of the true wonders of early Africa. Although rebuilt in the last century, the Sankor Mosque, Timbuktu, and that at Jene both in Mali, date back to the early 14th century. Mud walls, constantly renewable, cover a timber frame, although this is more like scaffolding than anything more elaborate or substantial. They look like giant termites nests, their minarets h hollowed out inside. The mosques of Bobo Dialasso in Burkina and Kong and Ivory Coast are smaller and, due to a moister climate, use larger buttresses and more timber. A greener architecture, 
This is an ecologically sound, indigenous architecture that is very much back in favor. At the beginning of the 21st century, the story of architecture is one of stretching new technologies and new ideas to previously unthought of limits. And yet, there are forms of architecture such as these impressive mud mosques that draw us up short and show how much can be achieved working with few resources, little money, and for every man. Egyptian temples. Beyond the pyramids, the most important Egyptian monuments are the temple they built for the popular worship of the gods during the new kingdom, circa 1550 to 1070 BC. The most famous are the great temple of Amun at Karnak, begun in circa 1530 BC, and the temple of Luxor, Thebes, circa 1408 BC. These enormous buildings are approached along avenues lined with sphinxes, MD under frightening entrance gates or pylons that lead into colonnaded halls, courtyards, and sanctuaries. The walls of the pylons are typically battered, that is, they slope inward from bottom to top. This was a way of building strongly and assuredly with mud bricks, although it eventually became a style of building that characterized much ancient and revived Egyptian architecture. The columns were painted and decorated and were much heavier than those of ancient Greece and Rome. The whole effect, especially inside these complex buildings, must have been mysterious in the extreme. The hypo-style hall of the Great Temple of Amun is quite daunting. A forest of no fewer than 134 columns in 16 rows supporting a stone slabbed roof that rises 79 feet 24 meters into the sun flecked gloom the chamber measures 338 by 170 feet 103 by 52 meters and is lit by sunlight filtering through a clear story or pierced stone blocks set between the tops of the walls and the roof the temples were walled around and their grounds contained houses and stores for priests and servants as well as a sacred lake, the one at Karnak survives. The temple at Karnak was extended over a period of no less than 1000 years and yet even experts find it difficult to date its different parts to say that styles were very slow to change in ancient Egypt can only be a massive understatement. Even so, there are a number of distinctive buildings that show very different ways of realizing much the same goal. The Great Temple at Abu Simbel, circa 1301 BC represents the Egyptians obsession with overscaled and even outrageous statuary. The temple is cut into a rock face, its stupendous entrance is designed as a pylon fronted with not one but four 66 foot 20 meter high seated statues of Ramesses XI, the dynamic warrior king who had it built. Inside there is a rather eerie 29 foot, 9 meter, high main chamber, its roof held up by pillars. In the guise of the god Osiris, but where the great temple of Abu Simbel appears to look back to a distant and unreasonable world, the low-lying and crisply colonnaded ranges of Queen Hatshepsut's funerary temple, I-520 BC, set against the overhanging cliffs of Deir el-Bahari, Thebes, appear to look forward to the noble and highly rational architecture of ancient Greece. The temple was designed by the architect Senmut. It rises in three elongated tiers linked by shallow ramps. Each tier proves to be a shady colonnade. The columns look less like the vegetable style designs we associate with ancient Egypt and more like prototypes for their Doric Greek successors. The walls are highly decorated with scenes of the life of Hatshepsut, a very dynamic woman, including that of her allegedly divine birth. At the top of the temple is a giant altar to the sun god Ra. The queen herself was buried in a chamber at the end of a corridor deep inside the cliff face. Although the Egyptians thrived for another 1,500 years, their art and architecture tended to ossify and never again reached the peaks of the Great Pyramids of the 3rd millennium BC, or the temples of the 2nd millennium. But in the structures of ancient Egypt lay the essential building blocks of virtually all architecture since. 